UFC 307, Alex Pereira versus Khalil Roundtree. Here are five ways Khalil Roundtree could beat Alex Pereira. <laughs> First reason, number one, Khalil Roundtree packs some power. Sure, he might not have clean KOs like Alex Pereira does, but the guy hits really hard. He's very, very big and he packs a serious punch. I don't see him KOing Alex Pereira out cold. Like, Portan is, he's got a chin on him. I mean, the only guy to ever really put him out cold was Israel and it took him four tries to do it. The guy's seriously got a chin and he's got, a lot of people say he fights with his hands down, right? But if you look at his sparring footage, the guy's got very good head movement, very good um, awareness of punches coming. He sees everything coming, dodges, he's got good head movement, good slips, good counters. So, sure, he's a very, very good kickboxer there, but I think maybe... If Khalil Roundtree trains properly and has that just one hit of power that catches Alex Pereira, maybe that could like, you know, start a cascading effect where he gets a TKO. Not very likely, but that's one reason. Second reason being, Khalil Roundtree has actually fought an elite kickboxer before. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but there was a guy called Gokhan Saki uh, back in the day. Uh, I think he was a K1 champion, if I'm not mistaken, or he was like at least one of the top level fighters in K1. K1 being kickboxing in Japan. The guy's beaten a whole bunch of guys. I think he's beaten Peter Ertz. He's beaten a whole bunch of dudes in uh, Ibadar Hari. Beaten a bunch of guys in kickboxing. And then towards the end of his career, came into the UFC. Uh, had a great fight with a Brazilian dude. I think his name was Luis Silva. A bit of a slobber knocker. But his next fight was against Khalil Roundtree. Everyone was just like, yeah, Gokhan Saki is going to run through this guy. Like, you know, what's Khalil Roundtree going to do to him? It took Khalil Roundtree less than three minutes to dispatch of Gokhan Saki. He uh, caught a kick, hit him with a... Beautiful, I think it was a left hand, left straight, yeah. Dropped him and you, the, the rest was just uh, history. He beat the living daylights out of him on the ground and Gokan Saki after that retired, never fought in MMA again. And so, sure, the styles are a little different. Gokan Saki, is, he fights like the Dutch style of fighting, right? Like the, the gloves in between and just comes like marauding. Alex Pereira is not that guy. Like, you know, Alex Pereira is a very clean kickboxer. Comes from a long lineage of Brazilian kickboxers. Francisco Filio, guys like that. The guy who invented the question mark kick. If you don't know who that is, please check him out. You can go back to the old YouTube videos and watch his K1 fights. Francisco Filio. So, Brazil has a tradition of not just Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but also world-class kickboxers. You'll even see it in, in the UFC. You've got uh, Edson Barboza, one of the best kickboxers in the UFC, right? Muay Thai specialist. So, Alex Pereira might not possess the same skills as Gokhan Saki does, but in terms of just headspace and just mental fortitude, Khalil Roundtree has faced an elite kickboxer before. So, I don't see him having, you know, a, a mental deficiency when it comes to that. Now, that's the second reason. All right, reason number three why Khalil Roundtree could beat Alex Pereira at UFC 307. Um, stance matchup. I've talked a lot about stance matchups on this channel, right? Orthodox versus Southpaw. When you get these two opposing styles, a lot of different attacks open up for each of these fighters. Jamal Hill, in his recent podcast, although I don't really rate his opinions very highly on, 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 on strategy and all, had talked about how a Southpaw fighter could present problems for Alex Pereira. Even in his fights with Izzy, uh, when he would s switch to Southpaw, Alex had a bit of trouble finding the leg kick, a bit of trouble finding the straight right. So if Khalil Roundtree decides to switch stances, maybe that could be a problem for Pereira, but I don't know if Khalil Roundtree has the same kind of offensive and defensive capabilities when fighting from Southpaw. If you're used to fighting in one stance, your defenses and your offenses are particularly primed for that particular stance. So you're, if you're fighting orthodox, your right hand is going to be primed. Your defenses will be to move to your left or to your right. It is at certain angles in certain areas that you will be moving in. When you move that to Southpaw, it completely changes. So in my opinion, I don't know if Khalil Rountree has the requisite skills to compete with Alex Pereira in a southpaw position because Pereira will always fight orthodox and that's his that's his bread and butter right like his left hook he's got a beautiful left hook and he's got excellent kicks in his arsenal so he's going to fight that style but if Khalil Roundtree can make a southpaw style work against uh, Pereira maybe that's his avenue of victory that's the third reason the fourth reason being Khalil Roundtree decides to take this to the ground sure better guys have tried better guys have failed Jan Blahovic tried, got Alex Pereira's back, but could not finish him. Izzy took him down, but could not finish him. He's had take guys like Bruno Silva try to take him down. He's had a whole bunch, even Yiri Prohashka tried taking him down. But the guy is 
he's working with a very good MMA grappler in Glover Teixeira. So he understands takedown defense. And you have to also remember Glover Teixeira used to train with one of the best takedown defense artists in UFC history, a guy called Chuck Liddell, right? The Iceman, that's what, that was his style, uh, sprawl and brawl. He was a defensive wrestler, wrestled in uh, college, very good at anti-wrestling. So I'm assuming Glover and the guys at the pit picked this up from him and has trained Alex Pereira for that. His cage wrestling is very good. I haven't seen him stop many open mat takedowns, but no, nobody's really tried taking him down the open mat because he's so dangerous. I don't know if Khalid Roundtree has the requisite ground skills to take him down, but that's a very open strategy for him if he decides to start wrestling with him. Although, again, he's said in many interviews that he's like, I've never taken anybody down. I'm always going to stand up with them on the feet. But guys find out real quick, you know, that Alex Pereira is not someone you want to be fighting on the feet for extended periods of time. Yiri Prohachka will tell you that exactly what happened to him when he started fighting him on the feet. That's the fourth reason. The fifth reason being MMA is an unpredictable sport. Anything could happen. I mean, it happened to Khalil Roundtree, right? He first, he got Johnny Walker walking into the UFC and people were like, who the hell is this guy, Johnny Walker, name of some booze company. You know, like, like people didn't take him seriously. Got Khalil Roundtree in a clinch and basically hammered him with elbows until the guy quit. He's been taken down out before. Like guys like Ion Kunte Laba have taken him to the ground and beaten the living daylights out of him. Andrew, Andrew Sanchez grounded him in the TUF final. So he's had bad losses like that. But again, anything can happen in MMA. He could kick Alex Pereira and Alex Pereira's knee explodes. Right, like that could happen, takes a wrong step, knee, like something happens to his ankle, twists his ankle, the wrong side gets hit with a punch that didn't see coming. The unpredictability of MMA is the fifth reason why I think Khalil Ranji could beat Alex Pereira, could hit him with a spinning back fist, spinning hook kick, who knows? Thing, things that he may have never shown in his previous fights, but learned for this one particular fight and decided like, let's try it. This has happened a lot of times in MMA before. We've Pundits have sat there and said, you know, I'm 100% sure that this guy is going to beat this guy. Oh, this guy is going to trash this guy. This guy is going to beat the living daylights out of this guy. How many times has that been proven wrong? Nobody thought Bilal was beating Leon Edwards. But Bilal beat the living daylights out of Leon Edwards. No one thought Mirab had a chance against Sean O'Malley. But here we are, right? In the era of two champions that people had gave zero chance to. No one gave Strickland a chance against Israel. Everyone's like, yeah, Israel, beautiful counter-striker, great counter -striker. Sean all struck him. MMA is an unpredictable sport by nature. Sports like boxing, wrestling, they have a certain, their rule sets dictate order. MMA's rule set dictates chaos. So the way he could beat him is by just engaging in absolute chaos, right? These are the five ways Alex Pereira could lose to Khalil Roundtree. Now, one other fight I want to talk about in the card, the rest of the card is women's MMA and you guys all know I really don't care about that. The one fight I really, really want to talk about, and it's close to my heart, is the return of Jose Aldo. Jose is the king of Rio. What can be said about the guy? I mean, sure, his aura was, you know, stolen by Connor with that 13-second knockout. And it hurts me to say this, that Jose never got that rematch, because I think he could have beaten Connor. His boxing was really good. His takedown defense is excellent. His Muay Thai is just beautiful, sublime to watch. He was denying Frankie Edgar. Uriah Faber, Mark Hominick, Kenny Florian. I mean, dude, I can go down just a list of names of the guys he's beaten. He's moved down from featherweight to bantamweight and he's had some tough losses there. For example, his loss to Peter Yan was a brutal beating, but Peter Yan is Peter Yan. He's a dangerous, dangerous fighter and Jose Aldo is just not equipped to handle that guy. But this is the dude that fought Frankie Edgar three times, beat the living daylights out of Frankie Edgar, beat the living daylights of Ricardo uh, Lamas, Right? Even his recent fights fought Jonathan Martinez. Jonathan Martinez, if people don't know, is one of the most dangerous upcomers there. He leg kicked Cub Swanson almost into retirement. Like the guy is very, very, very dangerous. Right? Jose Aldo beat him, pillar to post in his last fight. But now he's up against a guy called Mario Bautista. Mario Bautista is not a household name. He's not Sean O'Malley. He's not Corey Sandhagen, although he did lose to Corey Sandhagen. But Mario Bautista is a killer. Right, his last fight, I think, was against Ricky Simone, if I'm not mistaken. And just, again, beat him from pillar to post. This is a young lion. Josie Aldo is 38 years old, man. 38 years old in the Bantam division is not a good... It's just not a good combination. You're not going to get very far. But Josie Aldo has proven us all wrong. I'm hoping to see the return of the King of Dio one more time. You know, just so that... I hate the song, but just so that I can hear Rihanna play one more, blaring down the speakers before he takes on Mario Bautista. So... This was basically 
our breakdown of UFC 307. The main card is, we've got, I think, two very, very interesting fights. Uh, the third one being Roman Dolize versus Kevin Holland. A bit of a middleweight scrap there. But the two women WMMA fights, I don't know if they, you know, people do care about that. Maybe I'm bathroom breaks for that kind of stuff. But, uh, anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, we'll see you guys in the next Live MMA show. Uh, please like, share, subscribe. And remember, Live MMA now.